China seeks to criminalize anyone hurting the feelings of its people. Canada opens public inquiry into election interference by China. Unable to pay salaries to civil servants, Hebei authorities ask the temple for money. Japan received over 30,000 harassing calls from China after the Fukushima wastewater discharge. U.S. Vice President underscores importance of stability and peace in Taiwan Strait. The Chinese Communist Party, or CCP regime, is trying to criminalize speech and actions by outsiders that Beijing disapproves of. This move has strongly been criticized by legal experts. According to Nikkei Asia, China's legislature on August 28th deliberated on draft amendments to China's public security administration law that would ban behavior, clothing, and speech detrimental to the Chinese national spirit, or that hurts the feelings of the Chinese people. The draft changes do not specify what images or words might be considered an offense, which could lead to a fine of up to $680, or 5,000 yuan, or up to 15 days in prison. Many legal experts are concerned over the vague wording and lack of definitions in the draft law that could give authorities uncontrolled powers. Tong Ju Wei, professor of constitutional law at East China University of Political Science and Law, asked, who determines what are the feelings of the Chinese nation, and what procedures are followed to recognize and determine it. He added, These are huge problems that are almost impossible to implement in accordance with the principles of the rule of law. Lao Dongyan, a criminal law professor at Tsinghua University, said, Due to the ambiguity of punishment standards, it will inevitably lead to selective enforcement of administrative power, which is prone to abuse of power thus creating a new space for the breeding of corruption and may intensify conflicts between the police and the public, bringing new risks to social stability. Zhao Hong, a law professor at the Chinese University of Political Science and Law, said the lack of clarity could lead to an infringement of personal rights. She wrote in an article published on September 6, What if the law enforcer, usually a police officer, has a personal interpretation of the hurt and initiates moral judgment of others beyond the scope of law. The draft law is just one example of how Chinese President Xi Jinping has sought to redefine what makes a model Chinese citizen since he rose to leadership in 2012. In 2019, his party issued morality guidelines, which include directives like being polite, traveling with a lower carbon footprint, and having faith in Xi and the party. Canada has appointed a Quebec judge to lead an independent public investigation into allegations of foreign interference in Canadian elections. The announcement comes after opposition parties have pressed Justin Trudeau's liberals for months to open a full inquiry amid claims of meddling by China. They demanded an investigation into China's influence on Canadian elections and policy. Federal Public Safety Minister Dominique Leblanc announced on September 7th that Justice Marie-José Hogue from the Quebec Court of Appeal, will lead the inquiry. Ms. Og will investigate possible interference from China, Russia, and other foreign actors. She will examine the impacts on election integrity at national and electoral levels in the 2019 and 2021 elections. LeBlanc said, Justice Og will have full access to all relevant cabinet documents, as well as all other information she deems relevant for the purposes of her inquiry. Earlier this year, Canada's newspaper Globe and Mail, citing classified Canadian Security Intelligence Service, or CSIS, documents, reported the deep level of the CCP's involvement in the Canadian elections. It reveals that the CCP leadership in Beijing pressured its consulates to leverage politically active Chinese community members and associations in Canada while concealing their links to the CCP. The key strategy deployed by China in the election interference is to influence mainland Chinese-Canadian voters. In March, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau appointed a special investigator to probe alleged election interference by the Chinese regime. But three months later, the special investigator was forced to resign due to widespread opposition to his appointment and his work. Over the past six months, China's economy has faced several challenges, including slow GDP growth record high youth unemployment, sluggish foreign investment, weak exports and currency, 
and a struggling real estate sector, leading to waves of wage demands in many places. On September 5th, a video demanding unpaid wages went viral online. In the video, dozens of people held banners with black text on a white background that read, No salary for half a year. We want to survive. We implore the government to resolve this for us. A woman shouted, I haven't been paid for eight months. And many others joined in, saying, We want to survive. We want to live. Some netizens commented, I couldn't believe that the radio and television station would end up like this. According to publicly available information, China Radio and Television Group and the State Administration of Radio, Film, and Television are state-owned and monopoly enterprises. They used to have high perks and good benefits, so anyone wanting to join had to go through backdoor channels. On September 5th, Zhao Lanjian, a former Chinese media employee, tweeted that the Hebei District authorities in Tianjin City had no money to pay civil servants in March and April, so they borrowed several hundred million yuan from the Daibi Monastery. However, they again ran out of money and continued approaching the monastery for loans, but the monastery refused. Some netizens sarcastically commented on Twitter, at most, they'll launch a campaign against Buddhism and arrest some big business owners. Some even said, this is the next gold mine after the anti-corruption campaign in healthcare. On September 4th, due to not receiving pensions, many teachers who retired in Jiutai City, Jilin Province, went to the local authorities to file collective complaints. A video showed a crowded complaint room, with hundreds of people waiting outside in the square. On September 4th, as the new school year began, over a hundred teachers and staff at the number one middle school in Mengjin District, Luoyang City, Hunan Province, sat in protest outside the school gate as they had not received salaries for several months. On the same day, teachers at the number two junior high school in Mengjin District also protested outside the principal's office against wage arrears. Such wage protest incidents frequently appear on various social platforms. The Telegraph recently reported that China is on the verge of economic and social collapse. The Chinese Communist Party, or CCP regime, has implicitly acknowledged this issue. On July 24th, during a meeting of the Central Committee's political bureau, the highest authority of the CCP pointed out that China's economic activities are currently facing new difficulties and challenges, many due to insufficient domestic demand, difficulties faced by some enterprises, and many hidden risks in key areas. The external situation is very complex and severe. Wang Dan, a Chinese political scholar and democracy activist currently living in Taiwan, told VOA that the Chinese government P is facing a significant crisis. And if Xi Jinping doesn't stop talking about the imminent danger all the time, the biggest crisis the regime faces is the economic issue. The economic recession is especially evident in three aspects. The real estate sector can't recover, high youth unemployment, and tight local finances. These three factors threaten the regime's stability. But currently, we don't see any better strategies for the Chinese government P to mitigate the crisis. After Japan's Fukushima plant's treated nuclear wastewater began discharging into the sea on August 24th, various regions of Japan received many harassing calls from China. From September 1st, the Tokyo government decided to use an automated Chinese voice system to respond to those calls. An official of Fukushima said that from August 24th, the city began receiving calls with China's country code plus 86. The number of calls increased to more than 200 the next day, overloading the phone lines and disrupting the city government's daily work. The official said on the same day, some elementary and middle schools in the city also received 65 similar calls. Municipalities, hotels, and restaurants have also received similar calls since Japan began to discharge nuclear wastewater. As of the end of August, Tokyo authorities have received more than 30,000 harassing calls suspected to be coming from China. They then decided that from September 1st, if they received a call in Chinese, they would switch to an automated Chinese voice system to answer. The answer from Japan is, did you know the discharge of treated water is carried out according to international standards and international practices and is carried out after fully implementing safety measures? Within one year, some Chinese nuclear power plants discharged about 10 times more tritium into the sea than Japan's Fukushima nuclear power plant. Japan's automated Chinese voice system had answered 198 calls within an hour and a half. Many Japanese netizens have appreciated Tokyo's approach. 
One of them commented, After receiving a phone call starting with the country code plus 86, it is believed that the Chinese government is the main suspect. Japan should file a complaint with the World Trade Organization, WTO, or impose strict import and export rules against Beijing. If Japan fights back, the world will support us. Another Japanese netizen said that based on the number of harassing phone calls Tokyo received, this is a criminal case of obstructing business activities. The Chinese government can be asked to assist in criminal investigations. If China does not rectify itself, legal measures will be needed. Tokyo should also inform Beijing that it will not rule out banning the import of aquatic products from China. One Japanese netizen believes if China attacks Taiwan with force, it may have to endure thousands or tens of thousands of harassing calls. At the East Asian Summit in Jakarta, Indonesia on September 7th, U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris emphasized the importance of keeping conditions in the Taiwan Strait peaceful and stable. Harris said in a press release that the U.S. is committed to coordinating with allies and partners to ensure the Indo-Pacific region is free, open, prosperous, resilient, and secure. Harris also said that freedom of navigation and overflight must be respected in the East China Sea and South China Sea, and all disputes must be resolved peacefully following international law. The Chinese regime claims sovereignty over Taiwan, most of the South China Sea, and part of the East China Sea. In a related document, during a meeting on the sidelines of the East Asian Summit, Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese also expressed concerns about security in the Taiwan Strait and the East Sea with Chinese Premier Minister Li Qiang. Taiwan News reported that Taiwan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, MOFA, greatly appreciated the U.S. Vice President Harris's statement. MOFA and Taiwan is part of the first island chain and has an indispensable role in the security and prosperity of the Indo-Pacific region. MOFA added that Taiwan will join, like other-minded countries, in countering regional authoritarianism, preserving shared democratic values, and maintaining peace and prosperity in the Taiwan Strait. Almost every day, the Taiwanese army has to track the Chinese regime's aircraft and warships as they continue to harass and intrude on the island's airspace and waters. Beijing has repeatedly stated that it does not rule out using force to occupy Taiwan. Since Russia invaded Ukraine, concerns about the Chinese regime's invasion of Taiwan have become even more significant. The predictions suggest that the force ruling China will launch a war to invade Taiwan in 2027, the final year of Xi Jinping's third term.